Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. This is my 52nd lesson in my series, A Journey to Faith. This lesson is titled, King Amaziah Attacks the Kingdom of Edom. King Amaziah, in his wisdom, decided that it was his duty to bring the king of Edom back under the control of the kingdom of Judah after it had been lost by his great-grandfather, King Jehoram. Obedient to God, King Amaziah is successful, but when he returns from his victory, he came home, it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 14, with the gods of the people of Seir, he set them up as his own gods, bowed down to them, and burned sacrifices to them. God was very angry, but flush with success, King Amaziah became arrogant and proud and challenged King Joash of Israel to a battle, but it did not go well. A Journey to Faith is a series based on the genealogy of Jesus, which you can find in Matthew uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Amaziah, like his father Joash and Ahaziah before him, is another one of the kings that are not recorded in the genealogy of Jesus. The genealogy of Jesus goes straight from his great-grandfather, King Jehoram, through to his son, whose name will be King Uzziah. So sit back and relax. Don't forget to press that share button. Uh, Let's share the word of the Lord to as many people as possible. And if you do want to watch the video again, you can watch it on our YouTube channel or on our website at thejesusmovement.com.au. Let's begin. Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Uh, This is the uh, 52nd lesson of our series from A Journey to Faith, which is really a special occasion for us because it means we've been travelling through the genealogy of Jesus and teaching this for exactly one year now. So uh, we're at, as I said, King Amaziah. It just shows you uh, the length and breadth of the Bible and the amount of content Uh, that you need to read through and and learn and understand in order to get a full picture. So King Amaziah is the son of King Joash and he's the eighth king of Judah. He was born by a lady by the name of Jehoadan from Jerusalem in 821 BC and he ascends the throne at the age of 25 And he's going to rule for 29 years from 796 BC until his death in 767 BC. Amaziah chooses to follow in the footsteps of his father and he allows the high places of worship to stay. So keep in mind the temple of Jerusalem has been reopened but he allows the high places for the worship of foreign gods to stay. After establishing his reign as the new king of Judah, Amaziah immediately seeks revenge on the two officials who murdered his father and has them both executed. Now King Joash did right in the eyes of the Lord whilst Jehoiada the high priest was alive. But after dying of old age the king had the priest's son Zechariah stoned to death for opposing his decision to worship Asherah poles and idols. The king had paid the price for this for two of his officials then assassinated him. So this is the auspicious beginning with which Amaziah starts his reign, is his father's actually been assassinated uh, by two of the officials, and of course he has them executed when he takes the throne. When Amaziah ascended the throne, he first established his authority over the kingdom of Judah, and then executed the two officials who assassinated his father. But unlike many who came before him, King Amaziah did not put the sons of these assassins to death, for it says in the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded, if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16, it says, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sins. And so we find that as we go through the book of Kings, many of these laws which come from the the earlier period of their history during the time 
of Moses come into effect when events happen during the books of Kings. So once again, uh, the Lord had commanded, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sins. So when his father was assassinated, they didn't actually assassinate the son, and so he gets the rule. But because they actually broke the law, King Amaziah has them assassinated or executed because they've actually committed a sin under the laws of God at the time. And so that's the understanding behind what's happening here in the book of Kings. So although King Amaziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, like his father, he did not follow in the steps of his forefather David. For he allowed the high places to stay and the people of Judah were able to continue to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. Once King Amaziah established himself on the throne of Judah, he called the people to assembly in Jerusalem. When they arrived, according to each family, he assigned them to commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, according to where they came from in the territories of Judah and Benjamin. So remember, he's the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. So we've got the region of the Benjamites above Jerusalem, and then we've got the balance of Ju uh, Judah going further south. In 2 Chronicles, our first scripture for tonight for King Amaziah, in chapter 25, verse 6, it says, He then mustered those 20 years old or more and found that there were 300,000 men for military service able to handle the spear and shield. And so this always gives us a bit of scale of, of uh, understanding on the size of the society at the time because as we read the Bible it's often said how many men are able to fight and so we find here he's just the southern kingdom and yet he's been able to muster 300,000 men so obviously the population is quite healthy at this point in time. Now Amaziah sought to be the one to bring the people of Edom back under Israelite control. To ensure his victory, he decided to bolster his numbers by hiring a mercenary army of 100,000 Israelite soldiers from the tribe of Ephraim for 100 talents of silver. And so to equate this, 100 talents of silver is equal to 3.75 tonnes. And so you can see that there's still a considerable amount of wealth, even though this kingdom's been depleted numerous times. So he's hiring 100,000 Israelite soldiers. So of course these come from the northern kingdom of Israel, which they're supposedly opposed to, and yet they're still Israelites, so there's money involved, they're willing to come and join them. But God, of course, wasn't happy about this. King Amaziah was met by a man of God. And in 2 Chronicles, again, chapter 25, reading from verses 7 to 9, it reads, O king, these troops from Israel must not march with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, not with any of the people of Ephraim. Even if you go and fight courageously in battle, God will overthrow you before the enemy, for God has the power to help or to overthrow. Amaziah asked the man of God, but what about the hundred talents I paid for these Israelite troops? The man of God replied, the Lord can give you much more than that. And so we find King Amaziah is making his plans and God is already saying, if you want victory, then you must not use those who I said that you are not to fight with or to coexist with because these people are not walking with him. And so King Amaziah listened and chose to dismiss the tri troops who had come to him from Ephraim. Although they had been paid, they were angry with the people of Judah for being told to go home. So subsequently, the troops from Judah and Benjamin were marshaled, and King Amaziah led his troops southwards through the hill country. And so I'm just going to put up the first uh, map for tonight. I'm oh, sorry, I will come back to those in a moment. So I'm going to put up the first map for tonight. So here they are in Jerusalem, 
Ephraim is just up here in the bottom of the kingdom of Israel where the Ephraimites came from. So they were to go back home and the troops were to come down from Jerusalem. They go down through the high country, down the highway that's known as the way to Shur. And they come all the way down here and then they come off the highway. They pass through Arad, down the escarpment to the edge of the Red Sea and down to the Valley of Salt. And so this is where they're heading. They will also head down to Petra, otherwise known as Sela in the Bible. Uh, and we'll come to that in a moment. But just keep that uh, map in mind uh, as I'm uh, talking. So uh, reading on, passing Arad, they turned eastly onto the road to Edom and made their way down out of the hill country and coming right down to the edge of the Salt Sea, which is the Dead Sea, they skirted around the base of Mount Sodom and went further south along the shores of the sea until they reached the Valley of Salt. So this is that first marker which I uh, mentioned here, the Valley of Salt. So the Valley of Salt was the northern border of the Kingdom of Edom and it's a hot and arid place. And so I'm going to uh, pop up a picture here, so I've been here. So this is right at the bottom of the Dead Sea. So the Dead Sea is just on this left side here, just out of the shot. This is today's Jordan. And then this is the Arabah, which is just a absolute desert. And so this continues all the way down to a lap, right down to the top of the, of the Red Sea. And so you can see here that it's just this absolute flat plain. It's very, very hot and it's very, very arid and dry. But this is the northern kingdom of Edom. You may remember going back through the biblical uh, history that when Lot went there, this is the defined territory which came from the bottom of the Dead Sea. But at that point in time, the events hadn't occurred that were to happen during the life of Abraham and the land was actually used for grazing originally. It was lush and so we see that the Lord said that he would do what he did to this land and that it wouldn't change uh, as a consequence. And so today when we go there and you look at the picture behind me, you can see that it very much has remained the same. So King Amazai led his 300,000 men out onto the plain and assembled them under their commanders into the designated units. Their sheer number struck terror into the hearts of the much smaller Edomite army formed before them. At King Amaziah's command, no mercy was given, and the Bible tells us 10,000 Edomites were slaughtered and left strewn across the bar barren desert landscape. The king then led his army southeast across the Arabah Valley to the stronghold of Selah, hidden amongst the red cliffs of stone. And so this is the second location. I'll just go back to the map. And we find that this is uh, Petra uh, further down here. So this is on the side of Jordan uh, today. And so the Edomites occupied this region, which was very much on the Jordanian side uh, as opposed to the Israeli side. So they head further south uh, down here. And arriving at the stronghold of Selah, they found that it was hidden behind the escarpment on the eastern side of the Arabah Valley and another battle ensued. In 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 12, it reads, The army of Judah also captured 10,000 men alive, took them to the top of a cliff, and threw them down so that all were dashed to pieces. So I'm going to put up a couple of pictures uh, that have been taken in this location. Uh, it's quite famous, so many people would be familiar with this. So this is uh, one of the buildings that's here. So they actually, as you can see, it's been carved out of the actual rock face. These buildings didn't exist at the time of this part of the Bible. So these buildings were actually carved by the Nabataeans and they come from the second son of uh, Ishmael who was called the uh, Nabioth. So these are future descendants um, that carved here. So you can imagine in these ancient times, you can see these high walls that are here and the cliffs that are up above. And so there's a valley that's inside and they have today what's called the Sik, S-I-Q. And it's like a, a gap that passes between the rocks and they find themselves in this opening where there's all of these high cliffs 
in place. I have a second picture here. This building's known as the Treasury. And so this is another one. This gives you a bit of scale because you can see some tourists down the bottom here with the horse and cart and the camel. And you can see the sheer height of the wall above them. And so again, this building has been carved out of the rock. And so you can imagine as a human being being taken again much higher than the screen shows here and being cast off the top onto the ground that all of these people were actually killed. But it's called Cedar, Sia, uh, or Sela because of the red rock. Okay, and so you can see that that clear red distinguishing colour in the sandstone that's there. Now this place in history was uh, undiscovered for many, many years until fairly recent times because it's completely enclosed and no one actually was aware it was even there. And so in ancient times it was seen as a very protective place to hide or to raise your forces in that particular region. So going back uh, to the story, obeying God's command gave Amaziah a decisive victory over the Edomites. He glorified the God by changing the name Selah, which means rock, crag or cliff, to Jokthil, which is spelled J-O-K-T-H-E-E-L, and that actually means subdued by God. And so the description of the place originally was defined by the environment with the red rock, and then he changed the name based on the victory to meaning subdued by God. So from here on in, in the Bible, it's known as Jokthil. Whilst Amaziah's men from the kingdom of Judah had been engaged in battle with the Edomites, the angry Israelite mercenaries they left behind decided that they would go and attack several Judean cities between the kingdom of Israel and Beth Haran on their way home they killed 3,000 men and took lots of plunder. And so, ever the opportunist, they've just received a huge sum of money. And so they know that the army is actually gone. And so what do they do? They decide that they're going to take advantage. And so the, the uh, locations that it talks about there was Judean cities between the Kingdom of Israel and Beth Haran on their way home. So Beth Haran... Uh, it's actually not marked on this particular map, but it actually sits right on this border between the north and the south in this region right here. Um, so this is the area that the Bible's talking about. So between here and when they went home, they decided to raid a, a bunch of these cities on the way back. So incredibly, after defeating the Edomites with God's help, however, King Amaziah came home with, it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 14, the gods of the people of Seir, he set them up as his own gods, bowed down to them and burned sacrifices to them, which is just extraordinary. You know, I spoke uh, right at the beginning of this series about the differences between monotheism, polytheism and henotheism. Polytheism is when people worship multiple false gods. Monotheism is when people worship one god. And henotheism is people who worship false gods as well as the god of Israel. And so we see here that this particular king, as many of them are, are henotheistic. So they know the god of Israel. They've heard from the prophets that the, god, that the Lord said. He even obeyed the prophet from what the Lord's message was and didn't take these Ephraimite soldiers with him, and yet he comes home and he bows down and worships to these foreign gods. Which is quite peculiar because in history, we learn that when somebody was overcome by another enemy, the gods that they actually served, they would worship those gods because they would be seen as more powerful than theirs. Or they would actually be syncretized and joined together to form a new god, uh, believing that it would give them greater power. And so, we find here that this particular king is worshipping false gods and the God of Israel at the same time. The Temple of Jerusalem is functioning, it has a priesthood, etc. And yet he's permitting people to have high places and make sacrifices to false gods. And so this, of course, would make God very, very angry. And so God sent a prophet who asked King Amaziah, 
why he consulted these gods who could not save their own people. But the king rebuked the prophet and he said in 2 Chronicles chapter 25 verse 16, Have we appointed you an advisor to the king? Stop. Why be struck down? So he's threatening him. If you don't stop speaking against this, that he's going to kill him. And so we have this extraordinary situation. While we're talking about the prophets speaking as well, I did skip over uh, something that I was going to talk about at the beginning. And so I'll just mention it now before we go further. And these are these uh, charts which we, we put up. Now, at this point in time, King Jehoash is actually the, uh, the ruler who's in power in the northern kingdom of Israel. King Amaziah is the king who's in power in the southern kingdom of Judah. If we look here at whom the prophets served in terms of uh, the alignment that God placed them in either the north or the south kingdom, we find that Elijah was alive up until the time of King Jehoash, but by this point in time he's actually passed away. And so we find that there is actually no um, known prophet. The Bible doesn't name these as major prophets. They don't give their name. But it says that a prophet came. So we know that on the southern side of the kingdom of uh, Judah, God is sending prophets to Amaziah to give his word to them. At the same time, just to give us some reference, uh, Amaziah, his dates of rule are from 796 767 BC and if you look at the colour coding that's here we find that the Assyrian Empire we speak about each week is growing. It's currently ruled by this fellow called Adad Narari III followed by Shalmaneser IV and he's very very uh, long lived and we also have this ruler Asher Dan. So this tells us because Amaziah ruled for a considerable period of time that the Emperors from this uh, Assyrian uh, nation, they actually changed over three times during the rule of Amaziah. So just a bit of background there for what's happening. So the Bible tells us that King Amaziah abandoned the God of Israel for foreign gods. After being questioned, God's prophet told him as he left, again in 2 Chronicles 25 verse 16, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not listened to my counsel. And so God is always sending his prophets to counsel his kings, to give them the right thing to do. And so it's up to them to exercise their wisdom. If they do not, then there's going to be a consequence for them which is going to come from God. So Amaziah has returned from this battle. He's flushed with success. And he became arrogant and proud. So he wasn't going to have a bar of this prophet, whatever was being said. And so he decided he would consult his advisors and decided to send a message to Samaria to King Jehoash of Israel, who we've just mentioned on the chart. And it was actually a challenge to fight. You see, he thinks he's very powerful and strong now. So in 2 Chronicles 25 verse 17, he says, Come meet me face to face. King Jehoash warned him off, but King Amaziah refused to listen, so the king of Israel attacked. And so we find here that we have a shift in the politics between the two countries, because between the former kings, you might remember that they actually aligned with the kings of Israel to go to battle together. And so once again, we have a southern king who's actually challenging a northern king in order to overcome them and to reunite the people once again. So the end result is that King Jehoash warned him and King Amaziah refused, so the king of Israel attacked. So they engaged in battle at this place called Beth Shemesh, which is west of Jerusalem. So I'll just put the map back up. And so here is the location right here. So Jerusalem's here, Beth Shemesh is on the, uh, the end of the coastal plain, 
beginning to go up the escarpment up into the hill country. Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel and so they would have sent their troops down here to come into battle as their troops were sent down here to go into battle. There's a lot of uh, valleys here with large plains, plenty of room for battles. But the, one of the places, things about this is it's surrounded by these high hills, so that means the commanders would be able to look down over the battle in order to conduct their troops. So this is the location for this battle that ensues. So God used the army of Israel to destroy King Amaziah as his prophet had warned. So we learn once again that God uses other armies against his own people if they do not uh, listen to what he says. The men from Judah fled to their homes under the onslaught and King Amaziah was captured. King Amaziah was taken back to Jerusalem and forced to watch as 180 metres of city wall was destroyed from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate. Then he stood helpless as the temple of God was pillaged for gold, silver and articles of use. And, as if that wasn't enough, he watched as treasures from the palace and the hostages were taken. King Amaziah paid a price for his pride and arrogance, but King Jehoash left him alive and returned home. And so we find that flush with success, Amaziah had come back from battle. It tells you how they pillaged and took uh, back with them. So all of that wealth and power that he thought he had, it was very fleeting because God took it back from him again. The interesting thing here is, it says that God actually punished him, but in this particular instance we find that he was left alive and King Jehoash returned home with his armies. So going to a little bit of history that's happening at the same time, after defeating King Ben-Hadad III of Aram Damascus in three separate battles, and now King Amaziah of Judah in Beth Shemesh, King Jehoash enjoyed peace in the kingdom of Israel until he died in 782 BC. He was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel and his son Jeroboam II succeeded the throne. And so going back to the charts, I'm flipping around a bit, so it helps us to follow this. So we find here... Amaziah survives the battle, Jehoash has lived a full life and he passes away and he's replaced by his son Jeroboam II who of course is named after the first of the northern kingdom uh, of Israel's kings, Jeroboam I. So like his forefathers, when Jeroboam II ascended the throne of Israel, he too did evil in the eyes of the Lord because we know that they were worshipping the Baals and the Asherah poles. But the Lord said in 2 Kings, chapter 14, verses 26 to 27. So again, 2 Kings, chapter 14, verses 26 to 27. The Lord said, How bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. So this paints a picture of what life was like there. And since the Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. And so interestingly, we find that God's grace is still being extended to his people, no matter how wicked the leaders are. And so this is something for us to understand about the Lord. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. He does not want to punish us. He does not want us to come unstuck in life. He doesn't want us to be killed. And so he continues to hopefully extend his hand of grace to his people. So by the grace of God, King Jeroboam II was able to restore the boundaries of the kingdom of Israel. And the Bible tells us from Lebo Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, which is the, the Dead Sea, in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. So that comes from 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. So again, 2 Kings 14, verse 25. I'm going to uh, flip back to the map once again to show you what that is. And so 
he's talking about these boundaries and so he's if you look at this we're talking about all the way down from here all the way through and up to the northern boundary and so the kingdom of Israel is still a sizable piece of real estate the kingdom of Judah is much smaller the boundaries with the kingdom of Moab haven't changed the boundaries with the kingdom of Ammon haven't changed but what would happen we spoke about in previous lessons is that the kings from Aram Damascus which is today's Syria they kept coming down and they kept battling in this region and with the previous king we found that they actually succeeded and they took the territory so we find here that when the son of Jehoash, Jeroboam II, comes to rule. He once again comes back into this land and he pushes them back out of this territory. So historically, we're finding that this particular king is going to weaken the kingdom of Aram Damascus, their neighbour. So you can read about Jonah, son of Amittai from gath Hepher, And this is a town, as I said, between the Sea of Kinnereth and the Great Sea. And so uh, Gath Hetha, I've marked it here, and it's this point here. So it's not far from Mount Tabor, and it's in what's known as the Galilee uh, Basin here. Um, and you can read about this, as I said, it's, uh, the reference is uh, 2 Kings 14 25, which we just mentioned. Uh, but it's being called by God. In the book of Jonah. So if you go to the book of Jonah, he is the son of Amittai from Gath Hefer. Okay, so we're coming into this story. So when we're reading our books of the Bible, we find that the different books have different messages to say or different journeys to follow. And so in this particular instance, we've come across this person uh, who's called Jonah the son of Amittai. And it's actually connected to this story at this particular point in time. So if you want to date when the story of Jonah occurs in the Bible, this is how we do it. Because it appears, this particular person appears in the story during the time of King Jeroboam II and King Amaziah of the kingdom of the southern uh, kingdom of, is of Judah. So again, if I go back, again, so sort of apologise, but it helps us to uh, teach and for you to understand. So if we go back here, as I said, we've got Jehoash, Amaziah, Jeroboam II. So during his reign, we find that this is doing the story of uh, Jonah comes into effect and so Joash ruled between 836 to 796 BC I haven't been putting the dates for the Northern Kingdom uh, specifically but as I said we have this overlap uh, with Amazia as I just mentioned here so if you look in those dates I'll just jump back to that sorry so between 836 to 796 BC if we look at the biblical references for the difference in the years for uh, King Jeroboam II, you'll be able to determine roughly what the period of time is that the story of Jonah, uh, the book of Jonah, uh, fulfills. So that's, uh, that's, that's uh, very interesting. Okay, so going back to the story, unknown to King Amaziah, there had been a plot in Jerusalem to kill him from the time he had abandoned God. When he learned of this many years later, in 767 BC, he fled Jerusalem to a place called Lachish in the Shefla Valley between Hebron and the coast of the Great Sea or the Mediterranean. Sorry, I'm going to change screens again. And so we're just mentioning this. So we go from Jerusalem down the way to Shur, just before we get to Hebron. So Bethlehem's here. Before we get to Hebron, we head down towards the coast, and this is where Lachish is. So this is located in Philistia. So this is the region which was occupied by the Philistines. Uh, we've got Gath and Ekron and Gaza. 
Giza up to Afec, Ebenezer, Jaffa. This is all part of Philistia. And so we find that he headed down to this location uh, called Lachish. It says, his conspirators sent men after him and they killed him and brought him back to Jerusalem on the back of a horse. And the Bible tells us he was buried in the royal tombs in the city of David. And so I have a picture for you. Uh, this is Lachish today. This is what it looks like. So you can see the Canaanite ruins. These are not dressed blocks. And so we know that this is for the Canaanite period. They're boulders that are assembled. Um, Israel is absolutely covered with limestone boulders. And so they're a soft boulder and they're easy to work with. You can see they're pretty uh, basic. They've got large boulders with smaller rocks propped between to form the edges. But you can see all the footprint of all the different buildings here. This fortress wall up on the top here. Uh, and some of the structure in the foreground over here. So this is uh, ancient Lachish. It's in Israel today. Again, we have evidence for the truth of the Bible. So during King Amaziah's reign of Judah, King Ben-Hadad III of Aram Damascus dies as well. And Tab El, T-A-B-E-L, ascends the throne in 770 BC. The King Adad Narari III of Assyria also died during this time and he was succeeded first by his son Shalmaneser IV in 783 BC who only reigned for five years before his grandson Asher Dan III ascended the throne in 773 BC. So again to bring some relevance to that, lots of screen changes tonight. So these are the mentioning. So we find that the, the king of Aram Damascus of Syria passes away. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier during the time of Amaziah, we have this change from one ruler to the next ruler through to the next ruler. Amaziah passed away in 767 BC. And so he is, at this period of time, this is the ruler of Asher Dan. And then we find when we come down into a couple of more rulers of the Assyrian Empire, we start to enter into the story of the Bible with these particular rulers uh, in, a, in a big way. Um, so, so we're up to this particular ruler, uh, Asher Dan. So we've had a change of king in the northern kingdom of Israel. We've had a change of king in the southern kingdom of Israel. We've had a change of king in Aram Damascus. And we've had three changes of king in the Assyrian Empire. So during the reign of Amaziah, it was fairly long. There was these two major events that happened. One was the battle against Edom, which he won, brought the false gods home, and then of course he was arrogant and decided to fight against the northern kingdom of Israel. He subsequently lost that battle, and then he lost his life when he was followed and murdered. Now at this same time, the last little bit of historical mentioning here because we're following what's going on with Egypt because their story increases in the Bible as we go further now as well. Last week we were looking at the reign of Pharaoh Shishonk VI or Shishak as he's known in the Bible and also came to an end in 790 BC and he was succeeded by another Pharaoh called Asorkon IV and he continued to rule Lower Egypt for only eight years till his death in 772 BC. Another king then called Shep Shakar Emir then ascended the throne and became Pharaoh until 767 BC when he died in the same year as King Amaziah. And so we find during the rule of King Amaziah there's three changes of Pharaohs. So part of the message of this is that the Bible shows us that many of the kings actually are very long lived in Israel. Whereas we find that the surrounding empires, they often change their ruler two and three times during the same life. And so we find here at the death of King Amaziah that we've had three changes of pharaohs, three changes of Assyrian Empire. Uh, and so you can see that their lifespan is not so long. Okay, so tonight's a shorter lesson. Uh, that is the story of King Amaziah of the Bible. Uh, he is actually the third king who's actually not listed in the genealogy of Jesus whom we're following but we can't not put him into the story because he's part of the journey and of course his son is King Uzziah who is the next 
king that's listed on the genealogy of Jesus. So I'm just going to uh, put up this end screen which we put up each week. Excuse me, clicking buttons. Uh, but if you want to watch this lesson back, you can follow it again on uh, Facebook uh, and watch it at your leisure. Uh, they will be posted onto our YouTube channel uh, if you type in Paul Brunton at the Jesus Movement. And if you would like to subscribe, that helps our ministry. And you can also watch it on our website, thejesusmovement.com.au. So thank you very much for joining us. God bless you. and We look forward to your company next time.